Oh, look at that. Protección. Sí. You need it here. I mean, Yo we sé. have a lot of it here already. Yo sé. <laughs> Porque cuando, siempre cuando entro en México, y sé que es súper como desarrollado y pff, mi, mis parientes tienen como casas en pinche Puerto Vallarta. Cabachos <laughs> ricos. Pero cuando yo entro aquí, siempre tengo un poquito nervioso. Like como, hay un chance que no, que no regrese. Que no regrese. Yeah. 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 I get the same when I go to Chicago. Really? <laughs> It's so nice there, though. It is, though. I, 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 I went to a place where they have the pork chop sandwiches. With the bone left in there? Yeah, I think I went there. It's called Portillo's? Yeah. Portillo? They no, call no, it Portillo's. No. no, no. This was a very uh, dark, black neighborhood. Oh, really? Yeah. It was not safe, apparently, <laughs> when I was there. I was, like, wandering like a tourist, like an upside-down tourist, I guess. It was weird. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you for coming now. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure. I, I know this is not your first time here or in Mexico or in Latin America generally. You, mm. you, you, you had some adventures. Yeah, oh. yeah. Yeah. Not so much in Mexico. You know, I've been here a bunch, but it's always... Further down. Colombia, mm -hmm. Medellin. Yeah, Medellin, Bogota. Yeah. You, you still Cartagena. have both, You still have your liver and your kidneys intact <laughs> yeah. and everything like that. You yeah. can wake up in a tub down there. Are they organ harvesting down there? I, I, I've heard stories. <laughs> I mean, they do it here in Mexico every now and then. You'll, you'll hear stories about, you know, people found empty. I don't know. <laughs> uh, we'll that's how, that's what, how they characterize people in L.A., empty. Yeah. I mean... We met each other on your podcast. Well, basically, you, had, you you were kindly, uh, you're kind enough to invite me on your podcast. It was great. No, Thank you were kind enough for, to come up. I mean, trust me, we that episode's doing great. I've been I've been following I've been following you. Like uh, you, basically, I, I found out about you during COVID. Like everybody was like locked in, and all of a sudden yeah. your name started coming up, and people were like, hey, check this guy. He's he's kind of telling some of the uh, insider secrets of how, what's going on and how they move things around. I've like, looked at you. Like when you hear uh, drug trafficking, uh, organized crime and all that stuff, you don't, you don't usually you know, imagine you know, a guy about your height. And, right. Uh, but I, I, started, I started listening to some of your conversations and how openly you were talking about you know, what you <laughs> were involved in. Snitching. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, I mean, I, I, I know enough about that world that I know you, it's not you, – you never name names. You never go into details about certain things. And also you did time. And, yeah, you, right. and you did time and you're alive. So it means if you were that, you probably wouldn't have made it out of there. No. Well, you know, that, the, the fact is most people that are sitting in federal prison – probably cooperated in some sense. I wasn't in federal prison. I was in the state. Um, just this is how brutal America is. Yeah. You get caught selling drugs. They make you snitch, and you got to go do your time. What a horrendous system. But I didn't I, – I was, I was able to dodge cooperation and, and a long prison sentence. You were involved in trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, can you – You know, not not to not to snitch it again. You know, <laughs> like or or do any of that shit. But uh, basically, like you you were you're from Seattle, Portland, Portland. But well, oh, it's like Seattle. It's kind of kinda well like Seattle. The last time <laughs> I was there, I got involved in some gender or gender uh, pronoun thing. Like I, I'm I'm new to the country and I, I I don't know how anything works. You know, and somebody was like, "Is Zer?" Really? Yeah, I got I got some of that. Who are you hanging around with when you go to these oh, cities? Usually, I uh, I I get hosted. Uh, I do classes out there oh. at uh, Ten Planet Jiu Jitsu, right. which those guys are great. But I had somebody kind of lecture me on gender pronouns, and I was, I, I I don't know a lot about crazy. that. I mean, it's new to me. I guess yeah. you know. Like, I'm open to anything. Like yeah. we just started stopped hitting our wives in Mexico. Like don't make us. Like let's baby step it. Yeah, like <laughs> slow down. Like I'm, I'm, I'm just learning. You know, so <laughs> they hit me with that, and I've hit them with uh, a migrante. And I, right. I, I, I won that. Portland. Uh, how was that? How was growing up in Portland? So we had none of that. Like that kind of ultra leftist or woke, you know, psychotic uh, culture. I didn't. There was none of that. I grew up in the '80s and the '90s, so it was just like a port city, right? It was. It's like it was a real great place to grow up very middle class but uh it was diverse back then too now it's not as diverse 
a lot of gentrification. All the black people from my neighborhood basically sold their houses and got out. But um, but yeah, everybody was involved in like drug trafficking and, and especially pot yeah. because that's where it comes from. You know? Yeah, I mean it's green out there and rains a lot. Mm-hmm. That's perfect environment for yeah. uh, for pot growers. Yeah. So we always knew somebody like his his this turns out this guy's uncle who dressed in like Birkenstocks. Right, dork, white guy with a huge beard. Like, you know, he, he turned the, out he yeah he got arrested. He did time back in the day for a, he was a gigantic smuggler. So that was pretty common. Just pot. But, yeah, but, but yeah. That, back then it was amongst the white people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, what were your life plans when you were young? Like back then, like where where were you headed mentally before before that turn? I just I was a real I was a, what do you what's the word? Uh, not recalcitrant. It's uh, incorrigible. Yeah, you, I just wanted to be rich. I wanted to not have a job, and I wanted to do whatever I wanted to do. I wanted to, you know, a lot of what I ended up doing is what I wanted to do. I wanted to travel in Latin America, you know, take private planes, you know, ball out, sleep with a bunch of, you know, probably professional sex workers who they call, but said they weren't. Said they love me. You hide your valuables before you yeah, get them in. For sure. We're, what you probably were watching Scarface and shit like yeah, that. Yeah, of bro. course. That was a huge influence. That was a huge dude. Scarface was a huge influence on because people like. But that was supposed to be made to warn you about that lifestyle. <laughs> I know. How, <laughs> but did you, you did, did you just watch half of it? If you basically no, just stop it at the middle. This is the rationalization. And all the rappers, if you listen to all the rap songs, they say, "Be Sosa, not Tony." So be you want to be Sosa. You Sosa be so- got away. Yeah, yeah. He Sosa lived. Yeah. Shit. If hustling is a must, be Sosa, not Tony. That's a rap line. Yeah, and I was okay. like, okay, yeah, I'll just do it better. Yeah. Uh, he shows us what not to do. Yeah, he this is a, that's a cautionary tale, just to yeah. divert. W- what was your first exposition into this kind of like lifestyle? It was like who who, six, who was who was the entry? Uh, like, what was the entry for? Friends, you? so Friends in high school had parents, you black the black guys. Black guys had, you know, fathers who they were involved in crack, pimping. I, I'm not trying to make a stereotype. This is just Yeah, that's this that, is was, the that was around, yeah. And so, you know, like I think my first the guy that I first, you know, bought my first ounce of weed from back in like 2002, I was 16, he you know, his dad had just got out of prison. And so, but he was already back like living in like a luxury hotel. You know, he. I walked in. He had two, two of his hoes because he was a pimp too. He had gator shoes lined up from like wall to wall, and he was like smoking weed in bed. And he had these two black, like very well built black women, you know, hoes, and and he was very rude and gruff. But like my friend, my good friend who I went to high school with, he vouched for me. Yeah, and so he's the one who put me on, and I was like, wow, this is the craziest thing ever. When you when you go there and you get that access, is it fear or excitement that's in you? Excitement and fascination. Yeah. Because like I I never thought when I would watch movies about, you know, these people that blew up to then get arrested and go do life in prison for drugs. I'm like, how do you even get to that point to where you can sell like I, I didn't understand like distribution. That's what fascinated me. Yeah. I'm like, where because I didn't know anybody who used drugs. <laughs> you know, cocaine, much less like, yeah, we all like smoked weed. It's like broke high school kids bought $10 bags. But like, where does all, where's all, all this economy come from? Where do these buyers come from? It's like the free market, you yeah, know? Yeah. I'm like, so I was really fascinated by it. it. Like, how can I figure this out as a business? You walk into this hotel room with a, basically a, an advertisement for what the life would bring you. Right, right. What, what's that first... I mean, basically, when how I know it works with some of these guys is first they test you. Yeah, no, I think this guy was because I was with his son. He was like, okay, this kid clearly. I mean, I had my backpack on. Yeah, you know what I mean. I was I'm just a skinny, like I'm not wearing a wire. You know, I was a <laughs> fucking child, right? So, but I had money. Yeah. I had money. I did. I wasn't. I never. I never took anything, I never took any product fronted to me. So it's it really, you know, in America, it's, 
the especially with weed even back then the the supply nearly outweighed the demand so yeah. people got to move it you yeah. know yeah so people got to move it it's like you know even in high level drug trafficking meth cocaine heroin it's like people take chances even with people that they are a little suspicious of usually because they got to get the product off you know did, did you get any feeling that your race and your appearance was Probably part part of the motivation for you to be hired by on by yeah by this uh, yeah individual. well yeah I think in Portland it's not really like that because it's it's so white yeah. black people just have <laughs> if you discriminated against every white person you would never you'd never you sell never, anything never sell anything. yeah yeah I get it mm -hmm. uh, you 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 start moving weed yeah that, that's that's the first yeah entry into it and it's you know. It's, there's a lot of it probably. Yes, but you could still make money back then. But it was always competitive in the Northwest. So you And know. when you say competitive, I mean are there like rival distributors? Yeah, it's that, but it's all if you get caught selling where you're not supposed no. to be selling, well, none of that. It's all free market. It's all like can uh, smokers are gonna go to whoever has the best price and the best product. It's beautiful. It's yeah. it's how it's how economy should work on, yeah. a print, on a principal level so uh no it's it's not like uh selling crack in chicago selling heroin in baltimore it's uh yeah it's all i was working off a pager and a cell phone pretty much from the time that i what started type of cell phone? what type of cell phone it was uh it had snake on it you remember snake yeah. it was like a nokia it's it was, yeah it's a probably it's like yeah the, it, these nokia indestructible phones that you yeah, can use as a bludgeoning device exact well actually it was yes correct and it was like you pull it was it had an antenna yeah. And I I bought an ounce of weed. I went I bought a scale baggies, and that was my first cell phone. Yeah, I didn't have a cell phone until two thousand two, no two thousand four. So I was already I had a pager. That's how I started. But I was like, this is not effective. So were you were you delivering basically? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I had weed at school. You know, kept it in the locker, all that shit. So it was real. It was real amateur shit, and we were just major potheads. Yeah. And I had no idea until I got to college how to like scale that up. What? So what? 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 what you're in college. What, what? What? What were you? What was your aim in college? I mean, was it? I, I imagine it wasn't basically that path, life path. I I know. I mean, again, I had no idea. I'm like, let me just let me just pay my rent off of it. Yeah, sustain, and, sustain, and I, sustain. And I started paying my rent off of it, and I'm like, how can this possibly get any better? I'm making like, <laughs> yeah, I'm making like fifteen hundred bucks a month. What? Wow. What have I done to deserve such riches? Uh, and yeah, because you know it was the cost of living back then. It was why it was like it was. We were just hooligans, and we just partied all the time. And and I, I got good grades. You know, like I, I got through school. I was always a pretty good student, but um. Yeah, it was just it took years before it really leveled up. Yeah. College. What were you seeing in college that changed your outlook as far as growth? I was seeing white boys bringing in like 20, 30, 40 pounds into Eugene, where I went to school, University of Oregon, and getting rid of them every week. And I was like, holy shit, shit this is ball fucking ball ballers. That's, that's volume. Yeah, exactly. They're okay, okay. I'm like, okay, they can do it. That's when, like, the urgency stepped in. I'm like, okay, I have to figure this out. Did you reach back to your contacts in the past, or how were you figuring out where to get in? No, now? so this is where we figure out, okay, I need, I need to buy in bulk at the best price because this is how I'm going to get – I need to step up from hand-to-hand -hand sales and start supplying dealers. And above that, I need to start supplying wholesalers who are supplying dealers, you know? So that that that's the the key back then was the best price and you got that by buying directly from the growers. So there were two main demographics of weed growers back then, right? Well, actually three. Uh one of them was like the indoor hydroponic grow yeah, scene. Yeah, yeah. Uh, indoor grows that never get snow on their roofs. Mm -hmm, exactly. Because it's stupid. Yeah. Insulate, guys. Insulate. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard. I've heard. And, you know, sometimes you would hear about big grow operations by, like, Asian gangs. They were doing that even back then. Yeah. Because they're just, you know, they're smart. 
And the, they organized. Yeah, they're organized. They can get people from China to come over to be straw buyers, to purchase houses, to, you know, in, in their grandmother's name, uh, set them up. But those were always getting popped because, you know, it was very difficult to figure out how to hide where all that power usage was coming yeah, from. Yeah, power usage. Yeah. And this is a time when helicopters were being used probably and therm yeah. thermal. Yeah. Yeah. Signatures. Yeah. And heat, a bunch heat, of ways. Heat and infrared and stuff like that. So the prices on those wholesale pounds were always high. That was always premium. Yeah. I dealt with that stuff, but. And I, was it better? Of course. No. It because it's fire. It will blow your head off. Like the, we call it fire. That was like top of the line, like white widow. Like it didn't even look like weed. It was just. <laughs> white widow. The crystals were frosty, dancing. Fr frosted. 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 Yeah. It looked like frosted flakes, but with more sugar on it. So it was like unnecessary. Yeah. I mean, some smokers wanted that, wanted that exclusively, but the majority of the market could accept what we called like commercial. Yeah. Which was grown outdoors in the forests uh, of Southern Oregon or Northern California. And this was really good outdoor weed. People on like the East Coast, the Midwest, certainly in Mexico, uh, would look at it and think it was grown indoors. Yeah. It was very good, but you could move it at a high volume quickly. It was like middle class. So I'm like, okay, that's a good target. So the two groups that were growing that outdoor en masse bud that you could buy wholesale, if you were, you know, picked up 50 at a time, I could get it for like 1800 or 2000. Those were the rednecks. I call them rednecks, but they were just, you know, these blue collar ex hippies who live in these small towns, and, right? In Mendocino County and Humboldt County. And these are, these are probably guys. Shasta that, County. And these are probably guys that own their own land and how yes. the, the, yeah. that's their property yeah. and they're growing it on their property. Exactly. And, and by 2007, 2008, there's medical marijuana that's, that's legal in, so you can grow a certain amount of plants, right? 10, 15, 20 plants, whatever your card allows. So what they would do is all the neighbors would get cards and they would combine grows to get like, you know, a uh, hundred plants, 200 plants each. You get like two or three pounds off a plant. It's a nice little, yeah. you know, say like a million dollar a year operation, but it's a nothing. It's a drop yeah. in the bucket compared to what the Mexicans were doing. And that's where you're going to get the best price because this that's, is, that's a third option. Yeah. And that was the main, for me, that was the main option. I'm like, I have to get to those guys because they're the ones sent up from, you know, the Golden Triangle, Durango, Sinaloa, Chihuahua. People basically learned their craft down here and yeah. are going to set yeah. up. They're probably crossed illegally or yeah. made their way up there and like, hmm, what can I do up here? Yeah, well, I think this is how it worked because I got to know my guy pretty well by the end. So they would send up uh, ba basically somebody from – one of these areas, probably Culiacan, uh, you know, the heart of Sinaloa, the heart of the headquarters. Yeah. Some person would, he would be the organizer. He would get funded from the bosses, right? Yeah. And he would basically hire a crew of obradores, laborers, right? Farmers. And they would all, they would all strike it. Yes. Enter illegally. And then you know, basically set up shop in one of these little towns, Crescent City. I mean, you got to have to look it up on a map. Yeah. Like so remote up there in uh, on the border with Oregon and, and Northern California. And they would just march as far up into the woods as you possibly can. And, you know. Federal land. Yeah, federal land. And they would, you know, clear, they would find clearings and uh, they would rig irrigation. And yeah. just, you know, the, I mean, these are genius farmers. They'd find where the light would hit it appropriately. And, you know, you could get uh, thousands of pounds every harvest that way. It's, I mean, all you really need is irrigation, pest, a little bit of pesticides yeah. for some of these. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, good orientation as far as the sun. And, I mean, water is plentiful yeah. up there. You yeah. know, some of the places that they grow some of that shit down in Baja, for example, there's – I've found a few of those mm -hmm. giant fields down here. Uh no, not a lot of water. So you would have they would oh, have to right. figure out water, and the right. weed is gar the weed was garbage. 
Really? Yeah, the weeds was not at any level as what you find up there. Have they figured that out, how to grow better weed in Baja? It's become not even – most of the weed trafficking happens from San Diego down to – Right, Tijuana, so, right. So it's become like a non-problem. Um, how wild is that? There's cross – I'm going to talk about that in my video, how the drugs are flowing south now. Yeah, yeah. The, the weed – I mean, Tijuana is full of – gringos smoking california weed yeah in mexico which is pretty funny and is it are there are there dispensaries yet where it's sold out of or it's still all it's underground it's, nebu it's nebulous yeah and people are being paid off and it's you know it's it's around it's all it's it's everywhere it's just you know it's still nebulous and still a cause to get to bullshit with the cops down just, here. just like everything in mexico nobody really knows yeah no it's <laughs> we don't know the true we story don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't know so you 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 figure out an economic source that is Mexican, <laughs> um, basically growing some of this stuff in fed, on federal lands and not taking a lot of risk around it. Probably employing the cheapest labor out there, which is legal labor, and doing it all to supply people like you mm -hmm. that were then gonna. Was there any conversation when you started getting into a relationship with them about? anything i mean are they just supplying you and not in leaving you alone to your work yeah of course of course there was no kind of no control or oversight no just, here you go i mean my guy you know who i developed a relationship with when you bring somebody you know a quarter million dollars every month you you develop a kinship with them so and i, I look i never saw these grows he would meet me uh at a hotel in uh, garberville which is a, a depressed logging town. All the industry has fled. You know, it's collapsed since like the 70s when the logging industry took a shit. But hotel rooms there, you know, during the fall, go $200 a night. How, explain that to me. It's because yeah. millions of dollars every day were exchanged yeah. behind those doors. So everybody from all over the country would descend on these places and to I, find a re-up like that. Did you get a sense of permissiveness at a official level, I mean, you, there's that amount amount of business going on there. Yeah. I can't imagine there's a sheriff's office somewhere around the area. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely sketchy because they would know they would always, you know, they would know where the cars would be leaving out of and yeah. looking to pick people off. So I I always paid a little bit more usually to have them meet me, you know, a few towns up. Like, yeah. like drive an hour and a half. I'll pay $100 extra uh, just to be in. To lessen the risk. Yeah, exactly. Um, I also had people driving for me by the end. Uh, so you wouldn't take any other, that, that specific risk of the pickup. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Just because it's such a long drive and I, I you know, I, by then I had a felony, so I'm not taking the risk. <laughs> you are, you're growing exponentially from this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking about quarter million. Uh, that was just in the re-up. That yeah. was just the the re-up, the, uh, the buy money. Yeah. You are employing other people. Uh, yeah. Are, are you, Not many, though. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty skeleton crew. Yeah. It's one guy driving, uh, one guy stashing, and then my partner. Yeah. You, you, like, when you go about building something like this, are you actually looking at people? Are you doing your homework on people when you start letting them in? Like, what's what's that process like? Yeah, well... Like, who do you trust, basically? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I was cowboy about it. Like, I really never thought about the cops until it finally happened, which is such a white privilege, if you want to use that term, which I hate. But it really is. Like, black people just have to think about cops more when they're selling drugs. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's uh, I, I get it. It, they, it makes them better drug dealers when you got to be on your toes. Yeah. Um, but I never... I was... The only time I was worried about cops was on the drive back north. Back, yeah. Getting pulled over, getting, you know, I never thought I would get big enough to where, like, they would try to tap my phone or, you know, somebody would wear a wire. I just didn't think it could happen. It was delusional. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't look for it. You didn't. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was, I was more worried about getting robbed. I was definitely, that was, that happened. You know, people got people getting stuck up because weed was very valuable. That's yeah. how people got in business. Yeah. You know, because because you can't go get a micro loan if you want to buy, you know, these Mexicans specifically, but a lot of these big growers, if you didn't have 40 or 50 grand to spend, they wouldn't even they wouldn't yeah. even meet with you. So how are you gonna get that money if you're just like a 20, 21 year old kid? 
And say you got clientele, you can move it. You'll just go, you go take somebody's stash and then you sell it. Now you're in business. Yeah. So that was very common. So That's I was, common. I was more, I was always on high alert for that. And security wise, are you arming yourself? Are no. you looking into that? Are you just realizing that that would make things worse? It would make things worse. It would make the criminal penalties higher. And and were these basically, you were educating yourself on the, on just seeing other people getting fucking picked up with yeah. guns. And you're like, well, For probably sure. not do that. For sure. And it just wasn't in like, it wasn't in our nature. And I'm like, okay, if I'm getting robbed, I'm fucking up. I need yeah. to tighten up. So, you know, the first time we got stuck up at gunpoint, uh, we 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 never made the same mistake again to allow that to happen. You know, how, how, how much were you robbed of? Like, was it substantial mm -hmm. as far as like? No, I mean, if they had hit the mother load, it would have it would it would have taken everything. But I think they got like a a pound, maybe two pounds, and like four hundred dollars in cash because we had it. We had moved it. You know, they robbed our house in college where we lived, and we we were keeping the load at a at a stash house so you know yeah good on us <laughs> lesson lesson good on us lesson yeah. learned you are you're growing i imagine at this point like what you you say there's almost like a personal relationship with your contact right um I imagine he's mexican i imagine yeah, he he's was, from a very specific part of mexico he was the guy so i didn't know these guys were from sinaloa until i actually went to sinaloa and i heard the accent and i'm like oh yeah these yeah. dudes are because okay because i just heard la verga it would not stay with everything was to the dick what, a la verga. A la verga. it's a it's our it's our version of fuck yeah. Esta de la verga <laughs> means it's very bad yeah or estas bien verga means you're you're a good <laughs> motherfucker right yeah um what is, but I he mean, was the one who spoke they, some Eng he was the only one who spoke some english yeah. and that therefore he was the ambassador to the distributors like me do you know what i'm saying yeah now, now when americans think of a it's a cartel guy you know they yeah. probably think pointy boots weird silk shirts with a cock and a, and a eagle yeah. or something like that yeah. on their gold chain was there was there was no, there any of he, that he was my age and he had an la dodger cap on and he was skinny all of the farmers because sometimes he would bring his guys to be in the hotel room while we were counting out they were like the fatter laborers yeah <laughs> he was the guy who maybe had family here he had had some kind of cross-border yeah, connection he's probably pocho you know basically have you know born right, out he, right probably kids up there already yes. trying to make his life up there yes or he right he was sent early so so now he's able to enter legally maybe he has a work permit like whatever it is he was you know he was the guy that i dealt with you're developing a relationship with him you know i mean that's a lot of money so yeah. i imagine they themselves want to keep their you're a client up there so mm -hmm. you want to keep happy do you get any source of threats, any sort of threatening? Like if you don't deliver, like you, you see this shit in fiction, mm, you know? Yeah. And, no. and, the, and on the other end, when you realize, when you see some of this shit for real life, I mean, you're both taking a fucking risk. Yeah. And those who suffer together, you know, because mm -hmm. it's, it, in a lot of ways, develop a lot of, you, there's a big relationship there. Um, do you notice any sort of like threat or if you lose this? There, is there any of that going on, or is it just like, hey, we're friends, and we're business, we're, we have a business relationship? Just you know, as as soon as I hand this over to you, you're it's on you, and exactly. there you go. Exactly. I mean, at one point, uh, towards you know, we're creeping into like 2009 to the early 2010, that the supply starts to really uh, start to meet parity with demand in the Northwest. So now these growers are having a harder time uh moving it right moving yeah. it fast and getting the prices that they want so uh so the growers really started like bargaining with me they, they would say here if you want to pay for 40 we'll give you another 40. okay and and i i said no i don't want to take that risk because then maybe you know i don't know maybe they if something fucked up maybe they would you know send somebody after me to try to collect but no there was no uh, the w right. weed's pretty chill even at yeah. high levels yeah you know and because remember when everybody's making a ton of money it's the it goes against logic why anybody would behave really uh savagely yeah yeah 
you 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 start off there, I imagine. So when does it change into other things? Well, I I only sold sold cocaine at low levels, yeah. like before the weed business really took off. I did it because. It was just a good. I just wanted to diversify my yeah revenue streams. Was it was it sourced basically from some of the same? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So I think I got up to like a quarter key, nine ounces, and I would do that because from you know end of June, beginning of July through you know sometimes as late as like early October, the weed supply would start to dry up. Now people that are younger don't comprehend what i'm saying but it would literally all of the weed there was a limited supply of outdoor grown weed it's a season it would get sold out it's a seasonal yeah. thing so yeah. the prices would go up the quality would go down and so you would be dry you don't have any dope to sell and so, this, so that's when this, i would turn to coke despite the common mis there's weed does give you like withdrawals there's there's weed withdrawals for people like people get really moody and shit like that it's fine though it's a great drug <laughs> Um, well, I got withdrawals from because I'm burning a hole from cash. Yeah, I got cash so like withdrawals. Cash withdrawals. No, yeah. to to people that you would say you say quarter key. Yeah, how much is quarter that? kilos? Nine but nine ounces. Back then, how much would that be? We're paying. Uh, I could get it if I bought nine at a time. I could get it for six to seven hundred dollars an ounce. Yeah, didn't have to step on it. It was just really, really high quality coke. It's before fentanyl. So I would break it down into eight balls, half ounces, and yeah, and I even sold grams. I try, I try to just the the beauty of cocaine of selling cocaine is that you can you can take a small amount, you can be low level yeah. and still make a high quality. If you're buying it from a wholesaler, a source, yeah. and you have that plug, then you can you don't have to sell to distributors. And take a risk that they're going to get popped and come back and and rat you out. Yeah, I know that most people I'm selling to uh, are just using it up right there. Uh, some people I would hit off with like half ounces. They would go back and sell it. But back then, who who, who were you like? Who, what's who's who's buying this? Because you hear about this, how Coke is still like, it's still the the the, the, caf, the, most, caf, the caffeine, you know, yeah. of the U.S. Like most who's, used drug. Who's buying it? So, well, in Eugene, it was like college students, like frat boys, the Jewish frat, like they're staying up studying for finals. Uh, it would be, I had some black guys that I think were cooking it up into crack. They were the only people that I, I sold to that I, I knew were reselling it. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, white girls partying. Uh, yeah, that was mainly the college. That was the, that was in college. Then uh, in Portland, I was selling it to like professionals lawyers um people i met through i i sold coke to somebody i met through like a, a professor i had at u of o sure so <laughs> you know basically it's a performance enhancer yeah because you just meet one person and then they introduce you to 10 of their friends cokeheads all move in a circle 